Right, okay. The money, Natira Carnevi, nature of the Carnevi. Of course, the dim the bottom bossib need arolog, ne trosolog, can whisper the Carnevi of own scores or hour. Of course, it's not possible to do a a survey or an overview of the nature of the Carnevi in the space of an hour. So I do hope that you'll bear with me. What I would like to do this evening is to hopefully give you some insights, perhaps some perspectives that, uh, that may be new to you or at least some food for thought. Um, Carnevi, a large area of, of land and a great variety of habitats, really, really give us you know, a lot to think about. They are quite different in character from the rest of Snowdonia and indeed from the, much of the rest of, uh, of the British Isles south of the, of the, of the highlands. All right. So just very quickly before I launch into it, just a quick uh, explanation of who I am. I'm John Harold. I'm the director of the Snowdonia Society, uh, a, a long-established conservation charity. So our interest in the Carnevi, in a sense, is the same as our interest in the whole of Snowdonia, and that is the protection, the enhancement, and the enjoyment of all that's special about these areas. And I hope that this talk will, will, as I say, give you some food for thought about what is special about the Carnevi. And of course, when we speak of the Carnevi, we think of the, the summits, you know, the, what comes into the mind first, are the summits, the, the really high ground. Um, there's much more to it than that, much more to these mountains than that. But it's natural to start there. In our thinking, in our mind's eye, that's what we see first with, the, with those, you know, with the, the name of the mountains. Uh, a high plateau, and I'm going to come back to this plateau, you know, if, if this is a journey, then I'm, I'm making it easy on your legs and, uh, you know, I'm starting you from the top and, and walking you down off the mountains, as it were. But we are going to come back up here, uh, and that's important because there's, there's something very special on these summits that, that perhaps very few of the people who actually walk them really, really have a, 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 a deep perspective on. So I, I will come back to this. And I'll come back in, in a couple of different ways. But just to, just to set that perspective, you know, this is a, a rather poor map, but it's a map, it's a topographical map. So it shows high ground. And what it shows, of course, is that when we look at Snowdonia, Northern Snowdonia, I should say, that um, although Erwidva, Snowdon itself is, of course, the, um, the, the most famous and the, you know, the, the, the honeypot that, that everybody from far afield knows about. In fact, the Carnevi themselves are by far the largest mass of high ground. You know, so the, the whitish areas on this, on this map are land roughly above uh, 3,000 feet or 1,000 meters, sorry, not 900 meters. Um, if we look at a different map, this is a map of the average wind speeds. And um, I think what's, what's really interesting about that is that obviously the Carnevi, this large area of upland plateau, is by some distance the, uh, the, the windiest the most exposed piece of land in the southern half of, of the British Isles. So it has the same, same colour intensity on 
on this map as, as large areas of the Cairngorms, for instance. So if we think about that, think about high ground exposure, particularly exposure to wind, these are the factors that shape the Carnedi, physically, literally shape the landscape, but also shape the nature that lives there. And on those summits, if you want to survive, you've got to be tough. And the vast majority of the, of the plants and animals that survive there survive by being extreme extremophiles, if you like, species adapted to the hardest of conditions. And in terms of the vegetation, that's the mosses, the lichens, the dwarf shrubs, and often, you know, amongst them, yeah, small creatures, invertebrates and small birds that can survive really, really harsh conditions for much of the year. Um, so obviously, in a, in a, on an exposed summit plateau, being very small and able to, in, to some extent, hide from the wind is an advantage. But being tough is essential. But it's not, of course, always the case that to survive you have to be small. Um, and you know, when we look at the, the, the rocky summit plateau areas, you know, we, we could be forgiven for thinking that most of the life there is, you know, is so small you have to get down on your hands and knees to see it. But um, of course, what we're talking about with these habitats on the very high tops of the Carnevi is a habitat that in other parts of the world is home to really much larger creatures. And these, of course, are the, the reindeer of the Carnevi. No, they're not. These are the reindeer of the Cairngorms. And reindeer are a large species adapted to the kind of harsh conditions, the same kinds of conditions that we see on the summits of the Carnevi. They're not there now, but they were there in the past. And I think uh, you know, if, we, if we imagine, if we sort of half close our eyes and imagine the Carnevi landscape with reindeer in it, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Ecologically, sort of in terms of the nature, it, it just gives us a focus point. This is far from a, a rewilding talk. I, I have a talk on, on rewilding that, that is coming up in the program soon, and this is not it. So don't, don't be distracted by that. But the imagination of landscape, the understanding of landscape through picturing how it, how it works, not just here, but in other parts of the world, I think is of value. So to help your imagination a little, There we go. The, the sight and sound of, of a, a tundra animal, and I'll come back to the word tundra a little later. But the summits of the Carnevi are home to Wales's largest area of tundra habitats. So, these, from, the, from the habitats that's, that elsewhere in the world support large animals, we come down the hillside slightly into the, into the heathland zone. So heathland in Snowdonia in the Carnevi is an upland habitat, very roughly stretching between 300 metres and 600, right up to perhaps 800 metres in places, depending on the exposure. And this is a, a habitat that, that brings the senses to life. Heathland in summer, the, 
the, the sights and smells of, of the heather in blossom, the gorse, the gorse with its amazing scent. These are large scale habitats, habitats that work at large scale and really quite significant in the, around the, the fringes of the Carnevi. Some excellent, excellent examples of upland heathland in parts of the Carnevi. Here we are at, um, in the Pensachnant area, the extreme northeast corner of both of the Carnevi and of course of the National Park. And again, in the um, in the, the valley at Abad, Abad Gwyn um, with patchworks of heathland, bracken, upland grassland, scree, and scrub and woodland down in the valley. A really a really nice mosaic of of habitats. A rich set of habitats. The the mixture of habitats together in the valley like this makes it a, 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 a very rich area for the wildlife there. At the large scale and at the small scale. And if we search in the in the heathland, you know, it's a large scale habitat and it supports a, a range of plants, some widespread like the heathers, some more specialised. This is the Cowberry, which is more of an at the at the upper altitudinal edge of the of the heathland habitat, and this is a, a, a common but spectacular species that particularly likes heathland habitats. You can see this is the emperor moth um, in Uncumraig or Ameraudor. It's uh, it's sit, here. It's sitting on bilberry and a spectacular species that very few people see, but is actually very abundant uh, on, the, on the heathlands. And if you're up on the heathlands in ooh, April, going into, going into May, and you see a, what looks like a, a fast flying, strong flying butterfly zooming past, and no matter how hard you try, you can't track it down and, and get a good view of it. There's a good chance that it's one of these. Um, so from a, a large and but, but poorly known species, a common and a relatively common species, to an exceptionally rare species. Again, a heathland species. This is another moth. And this is the tiny but amazingly camouflaged weaver's wave moth here sitting on a block of granite and uh, you know on the on a, a granite or quartz sorry quartz outcrop um, and this this tiny little moth is a specialist unlike the emperor moth which just needs a, a, a nice sort of reasonably varied habitat to fly around in. This little moth is highly specialised and it can only survive in a handful of locations where old growth heathland, mature heathland, um, you know, survives in very, very, uh, very, very long term uh, in, in good condition. Um, not too heavily grazed, not too heavily burnt. Um, and it's a it's a remarkable little thing. The camouflage is extraordinary, and I introduce this as one of the one of the special species of the Carnevi, something that very few people have seen. But it's there, and it's really in in nature terms, it's very important. I'll show you a little map of its distribution, and you can see. It's in the heathlands of sort of northwest Wales, uh, Snowdonia, and that is its entire distribution. This is a special subspecies of this moth. That is its world distribution. We have a responsibility for this little 
species. It's found in the Carnevi, it's found at Pensachnant, on, on, in that heathland that I showed you earlier, where the heather was carpeting the ground. Um, so a really, a really special species that, uh, that we have a big responsibility for. Much better known. So we go from a species that's, that's rare. I'll just go back a moment. This species is rare on a global scale. Its entire range as a genetic subspecies is the northwest corner of Wales. And then we move on to a species that's almost synonymous with Snowdonia, the Snowdon lily, uh, Lilia ruidva, or um, Bruinvila muniv and, and Gamraig. Um, elsewhere, it, it has other names, but Snowdon lily is a famous plant found in the Carnevi as well as on Snowdon. Um, not common in any in any of those locations but often thought to be a, a plant that's absolutely special to Snowdonia and of course it is special in Snowdonia especially in the British Isles because it's it's found nowhere else in the British Isles but unlike the weaver's wave moth that I just showed you this plant actually has a vast world of distribution the Snowdon lily is found across large areas of North America, large areas of Europe, right through Mongolia, China. It's got an almost circumpolar, you know, so, you know, it's a global distribution, which puts it in perspective in terms, of, in terms of how we look at what's special in the nature of the area. Uh, it gives you a different perspective on that. Of course, in the Carnevi, we have other other um, well-known glamorous uh, species that, uh, that have attracted interest of naturalists for a long time. The Arctic Alpines on the cliffs often um, right next to um, the heathland habitats um, in the same sort of altitudinal zone. Um, things like the Moss Campion on the left, the um, Dryas in the middle, and the uh, purple saxifrage or tormine porphor and gmraig on the right. These are all arctic alpine species of plants found largely on the cliffs and crags um, of Snowdonia including the Carnevi and often where the geology is calcareous, has lime, lime rich rocks. Um, that's the often the limiting factor for many of these. The dryas in the in the, the the beautiful white flower in the middle is found in the Carnevi, um, and I think maybe only has one other one other location in Snowdonia. And here it is in one of its Snowdonia locations being visited, being pollinated, hopefully, that would be nice to think, uh, being pollinated by another mountain specialist. This is the Bilberry bumblebee, um, sometimes called the mountain bumblebee, Bombus monticola. So a, a lovely combination there, um, two species in their habitat in the mountains doing their thing as they have done for a very long time. So we come down from the heathland and the, and the cliffs and we start the real, the, the shape, start to meet the shaping force of much of the Carnevi and the shaping force is of course water. In its, in its many forms, driven in the wind, flowing down the hillsides, freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing again in the winter, water shapes the landscape now as it has shaped the landscape for countless millennia. And 
the landforms of the Carnevi, the, the relatively smooth plateaus in many places and ridges, and the, the valleys which nestle into the sides of the high ground, mean that the Carnevi is an enormous patchwork of gigantic sponges everywhere where the, the hollows the land hollows in the landform allow water and vegetation gather and form these immense peaty wetland sponges holding vast amounts of water and characteristic plants of these really large scale habitats of, of the upland Carnevi are things like this, the cotton grass, Pleiaguenid and Camraig, um, a, a fabulous sight in the in the spring when it's blowing in the wind and uh, decorating the landscape. As a as an aside, I once um, did an interview for Country File with John Craven, and we sat by a bog with the cotton grass waving really beautifully in front of us. And he turned to me and he said, are those oxide daisies? Uh, which was a difficult, it was difficult, a difficult uh, question to answer with a, with a straight face, but uh, we'll move on. So the water gathering wherever it can, and of course, running off wherever it can, in, Imagine the shaping power over time of the water in all its forms on this huge high land mass. Whether it's in the Avant Gogh, or Réa de Vaur, or Cumcasseg in its many forms, whether it's a torrent, a vast spongy mass of wetland and peat, or a dripping damp wall of mosses and um, golden saxifrage. In, in its many, many forms, water is shaping the opportunities for nature in this landscape. And where there's water, there are mosses and liverworts. And in vast diversity, the wetlands, the, the damp habitats of the Carnevi, not so much the, the sort of Celtic rainforest habitats, but the but the the wet um, the wet hillsides, the wet rock foot surfaces, the bogs, the all the variety of open damp habitats in the Carnevi are home to extraordinary, extraordinary diversity of things like mosses and liverworts. And I'm just going to indulge in a few moments of bryophyte moss magnificence this is this is where our our biodiversity comes to life this is where we see a range of species adapted to our habitats that is on the kind of level that we normally think about associated with places like rainforests we can have hundreds of species of these small but individually exquisite plants in our in our wetland habitats it's so easy to dismiss moss but we shouldn't. We should look closer. 
and enjoy the beauty of small things. And this last one in that little run of mosses and liverworts is one of the sphagnum mosses, the bog mosses. And these, of course, play an immensely important role in the formation of bog habitats. Peat bogs are basically sphagnum mosses, the, the result of in some cases thousands of years of growth and sort of wet pickling of sphagnum mosses and when you stand back from the bogs they're not not necessarily the most dramatic looking habitats they tend to look a bit brown but in when you go into them actually being in a bog on a on a decent day in the spring and summer, the amount of life and the, and the special nature of the life that's in there is absolutely superb. And of course, it, the, the sphagnum mosses are the driver of this. They are the, the sponge to end all sponges, if you like. They are the, they are the species, the collection of species that form the peat, that form the, the biggest and the most dramatic of our, of our wetland habitats. And they, don't, they, they also have their own, their own challenges. So uh, in some areas, this isn't in the Carnevi, but it's a, a scene that could be seen in, in certainly in places around the, the fringes of the Carnevi where conifer plantations uh, run right up to our wetlands, our peatlands, where non-native conifer species escape onto the, the bogs and wetlands and over time can dry them out and damage them. So we mustn't take them for granted and uh, I'm glad to say that um, the Snowdonia Society is, has been quite active in helping to tackle this problem in a practical way with our teams of volunteers who go out and remove conifer saplings or like this group here go out and help with uh, work to um, really repair peatlands and wetlands you know blocking old, old ditches etc to improve the, the habitat quality and in those bogs, as I said, from a distance, they look a bit brown, perhaps a, a bit drab, but getting close and there are jewels in the, in the bogs. And this is one of my absolute favorites. This is a tiny little plant, but spectacular in its own way. And this is cranberry, the same cranberry or very nearly the same cranberry that, that makes a, a sauce at Christmas. Um, but a fabulous little plant that creeps amongst the, the mosses of our peat bogs in many locations in the Carnevi, often in association with some of our special insectivorous plants, things like the um, butterworts and the sundews, um, and those, those kinds of plants that are very specially adapted to living in challenging low nutrient habitats and also in the in those wetlands things like the marsh marigold the bog bean one of my very favorite flowers find a find a decent bog find the wettest bit of it where wellies are no use to you at all and that's where you'll often find large patches of bog bean a superb superb wetland plant okay we come down now from the from the bogs we followed the the watercourses down off the mountain and we're coming into the the woodland zone and the woodlands of the carnevi uh, often not as well known as some of the some of the uh some of those further out west the, the sort of the the well-known 
Celtic Oakwood, Merionive Oakwoods, those kinds of areas. But we have some fantastic, fantastic woodlands and patches of woodland around the fringes of the Carnevi. And again, high rainfall, um, you know, humid habitats means that below the canopy, these are places that host a range of life, perhaps small in stature, but rich in its diversity. And that might be amongst the ferns. So our, our, uh, our damp woodlands have, have a really impressive range of fern species, and particularly fungi. Many, many species of fungi carrying out an enormously important recycling role in the woodlands. And uh, they come in all shapes and colours. So again, as with the, with the mosses and liverworts and perhaps the lichens as well, small is beautiful. The diversity is there in our landscape if we're prepared to go and look. And I think there's such richness in the experience of going and looking it's something I'd recommend to, to, to anyone to spend the time, take the time to look closely, take the time to think about what's happening at the small scale, because that is where much of the, the richness of life is, is going on. And to take that to its logical extreme, perhaps. Um, again, on the, on the fringes of the Carnevi, within the enclosed farmland, um, the, the pasture land, we still have quite a, a, a mosaic of fragments of unimproved grassland. This is ancient grassland in many cases. In, in some cases more ancient than, than our ancient woodlands. Um, and where that is the case, where we find these pastures that have been grazed for centuries in many cases, but haven't been um, intensively fertilized, haven't, haven't often been plowed up, haven't been reseeded, these Relatively natural pastures are some of the extraordinary jewels of the Carnevi and of Snowdonia more widely. Botanically, often they're not much to look at. They look relatively undistinguished, boring, some people might even say. But some of them, where the right combination of history and environment have come together, some of them are very special indeed. They are amongst the world's richest examples of uh, grassland fungi habitats, where the most extraordinary diversity of species, beautiful, strange, unexpected, live and show themselves for a brief period each year that brief period is now. And in a single field, we could have many, many dozens of species of wax caps, of fairy clubs, of earth tongues, all kinds of species, different colours, shapes, smells, a phenomenal diversity. On a, on a level really not seen in many other places in the world. Something that, that um, Northwest Wales can be very proud of. And it's a, it's a product, it's a happy product of an extraordinarily long history of traditional low intensity, low input farming together with the the sort of wider environment of high rainfall, um, upland often areas, which haven't um, undergone the, 
the sort of more extreme impacts of of uh, land use change. So we're going to go from this sort of last stop down the hill as it were we're going to go back we're going to go back up to the summit now we've done a whistle stop tour of some some of the perhaps less um less widely appreciated uh nature and the range you know a small selection of habitats on the way and um, but we're going to go back up to the summit now and we're going to go back to those reindeer and you might wonder why I keep showing you reindeer and it's a it's a little it's another little exercise in imagining because this reindeer that you're looking at now is up in the Cairngorms and um, they were of course reintroduced there in about 1950 or so but in the Cairngorms um, reindeer went extinct within historic times uh, something like i'm not an expert on this but something like maybe about 800 years ago uh, the reindeer as a native animal went extinct in scotland but if we go back a little there were no reindeer in the highlands of Scotland, in the Cairngorms. If we go back, let's say 11, 12,000 years ago, the whole of that area was under a huge ice cap and there were no, there were no significant fauna on the main land mass at all. But there were reindeer in the British Isles um, around about that sort of time, again, it's a rough, it's a rough time estimate, but let's say about between nine and 11,000 years ago, the reindeer were between Kent and Cornwall and further north. There's a, a fabulous uh, find relatively recently of, a, of cave art in the Gower in South Wales at, a depiction of a reindeer in a in a a rock cave so what i'd like you to do is try and try and do some long term sort of time scale thinking and think back over the previous periods of glaciations that have taken place over the last tens of thousands of years with vast cold surges almost sterilizing the land with giant ice caps covering the British Isles and its and its adjacent land masses and then thawing and receding and with each wave with each advance and retreat of the of the uh, glacier fronts whole hosts of of animal life and plant life following taking advantage of new ground as the weather was the climate improved and then receding again retreating again as it worsened and became colder and the last wave of this or the most recent i should say was this uh, the, you know at the beginning of this current interglacial that we're in because all the evidence is that the cold will come back at some point um, we're a bit focused on on the uh, on the on the global warming the climate change issue at the moment but the cold will probably come back at some point and we'll have different things to worry about then but let's just let's just focus on this story I say for argument's sake 10,000 years ago this wave of movement as the reindeer and the whole arctic type fauna and flora moved back north from way south of where we are now came up towards us past us and moved on north and this this vast sort of slow migration of life 
was a wave of the kind of life that lives in the tundra. And the reindeer are just here as a symbol to, to give you something to hold on to for that. But it's, it's not just about the reindeer, it's about the, the whole suite of plants and animals that would have been absolutely part of the Carnevi landscape as that progression, that slow sweeping northwards uh, took place. And these are the plants that would have come with the reindeer, or rather it's the other way around. The reindeer came with these plants. Reindeer moss, the lichen, badly named, it's not really a moss, the lichen that is part of their diet is in this assemblage of plants. The whole suite of tundra plants like these, like this vegetation here that we see, this is on the, on the Carnevi, would have advanced through, would have been part of the landscape as it is now. And that's the point because on the summits of the Carnevi, the areas that are left today are very small, but it is the same vegetation today that has been there for many thousands of years. The summit tundra of the Carnevi is the most ancient habitat we have. And it's that habitat is some, sometimes called montane heath. I'm going to call it tundra because it's a great word and it's a great story that goes with it. So the tundra of the Carnevi is the largest expanse of this habitat in Wales. And what is it? Well, the word itself, tundra, comes from the Sami word, the Sami, the, the people of Lapland, the sort of northern parts of Scandinavia. Uh, the word, I, I don't know how it's pronounced, but it looks like tunda. And it means a large treeless area of mountain land. So the land above the tree line. And this tundra habitat is a direct link from the Carnevi between us here, the Carnevi, between Wales and the Arctic Alpine regions of the world. I'd just like to explore what that means a little bit further because I hope that the next time you go into the Carnevi and go up to the summits, through all those other habitats, that maybe you'll give this a little thought. The suite of plants and animals that are there, as I say, is an ancient assemblage, many thousands of years on those summit habitats. Now elsewhere in the world, we might see, um, an assemblage of life uh, living in those habitats, including things like the snow bunting. Well, we see snow buntings in the Carnevi, but not as a breeding species. I've been lucky enough to see lovely male snow buntings, like literally like little flying snowballs in the Carnevi on migration as they go further north. The mountain hare, of course, not in the Carnevi now, but certainly was as part of that wave of, of uh, high altitude tundra fauna that came through thousands of years ago. The Dotrol, or Hitanamanid and Cymraeg, a fabulous bird which has rarely, but most definitely has bred in the Carnevi. And that's probably the only place in Wales that it's, that it's ever bred um, in, within sort of you know, historical times. Um, and of course, the reindeer, which, as I said, came through, would have been part of that Carnevi landscape uh, 
in times past. So let's have a look at one or two of, of the, the special species of these high summit habitats, the montane heath or tundra habitats. We'll start with the dotterel, a fabulous, fabulous bird. If you've encountered dotterel in the mountains, you will know it is an unforgettable experience. Unlike most birds, if you come across them, you'll probably be walking along and notice that they're running around your feet almost. They are very, very um, unafraid uh, or are unused to humans and tend not to behave in the way that most birds do. So they'll often allow very close approach. Um, and, and rather than flying away, they'll often run away. An unusual bird in which the normal um, sexual roles are reversed. The female is the more brightly coloured bird. The male is the one that raises the chicks. The female simply comes in, mates, lays her eggs, leaves, often flies further north and if, if there's time in the season we'll, raise, we'll, we'll lay another batch of eggs for another male dotterel to, to care for. I'm sure there's a a, a story in there somewhere, but I'm not going to go there. Um, and this is the, the dotterel's um, distribution. This is a distribution map. The orange is its breeding range. Um, there should be a tiny, tiny dot on the Carnevi. It's missing from this map, but it should be there because they have bred there. And the blue is where they spend the winter. So if you just think about that, as a species that has bred in the Carnevi, this bird, with its annual migration and its global distribution, is a direct link from the Carnevi to the high Arctic and indeed to the, to the high mountains of, of both Europe and Asia. A direct link. The same bird doing the same thing because it recognises the same opportunity in the habitat that's there on the high summits. Very different example. Here's a tiny moth that again is special to the summit habitats um, of northern Snowdonia, certainly. Uh, it's a little moth called Catoptria furcatellus. I think it's common name is the northern grass veneer but I won't swear to it um, and it's very little is known about this moth um, but there's a couple of fragments of information that I love to share and the reason I love to share them will become extremely obvious very soon um, it's a special thing it lives in the in the in the very exposed uh, summit habitats where it basically has to spend 99% of its time at ground level to avoid being blown away. So a couple of facts about this little moth. It was first recorded in Wales on Snowdon in 1886. It wasn't seen again until 1930, again on Snowdon. And then there was rather a long gap before it was seen again. And that's the gap. So that was a, a happy day for me. And then since then, it's been found in the Carnevi and in the Gladerai. So it's known from now from all the um, highest ground of northern Snowdonia, including the Carnevi. And it's almost certainly always been there. It's almost certainly been there, but simply been gone unobserved. It's no, it, it's no accident that, um, that the first two records were from Snowden, because of course, uh, back in the late 19th and early 20th century, naturalists you know, would have had um, a limited knowledge of uh, locations to, to, uh, to go searching for these kinds of things. So that's the, 
That's the whale's distribution of this tiny little moth. Fair enough, with an outlier on the canevi. But again, here's its global distribution. And again, we see here's a species, here's a little, one tiny little fragment of the nature of the canevi that links us here directly to the high Arctic and to, in this case, the Alps. And I think that is a fabulous story. When you stand on those summits in that habitat, rather than thinking about the slog to the next summit, think about how connected you are through the, through the nature, through the plants and animals that, that make that place their home to these other parts of the world. I think that's a, an inspiring thought. So with that in mind, we'll take a very quick trip from the Carnevi. We'll go right up to high Arctic Norway. So if you imagine sort of in the, in the, the uh, top part of the distribution ref here, and we'll just have a look at the tundra habitats there. So some different plants. Um, this is um, mountain azalea, Loiseluria, its Latin name. Um, so we don't have that here in the Carnevi. And there are other plants that we don't have. I'll just show you a few for just for the for the joy of it. This is the alpine butterwort, dwarf cornell, which is found in Scotland. And this is diapensia, also found in Scotland. What's important here is that the individual species may be different, but the habitat is still the same. It's still tundra. It's still the product of extreme exposure. It's still a place where only extremely tough species of plants and animals can survive. That's what's special. The range of species we see in each place differs. That's part of the pattern of nature and biogeography. So if we look at the the habitat here in up in Arctic Norway in the foreground as a habitat it's very very similar to what's on the summits of the Carnevi. If we go to Orkney to the the cliffs much lower altitude but similarly extreme exposure mostly to wind and there we have Arctic bearberry for instance. So a species that we don't have here, but the habitat again is the same, it's still tundra. Same, same in the Cairngorms, where they are lucky enough to have breeding snow buntings, for instance, a wonderful addition to the habitat. But the habitat in its function, in its basic sort of ecology, is the same habitat. This link of the tundra from the summits of the Carnevi up through this huge sweeping arc to the high Arctic, I think is a, a beautiful story. We're right, we're right on one end, on the furthest end of that arc. And it's not a bad place to be. Here it is, back on the Carnevi, our very own tundra, made up of dwarf shrubs, mosses and lichens, like all the other tundra, formed through the extreme cold or exposure of its you know, sort of geographical situation above the natural tree line. And we'll have a quick look at one or two of the special plants. This is dwarf willow, a tiny tree and when I say tiny, this is a willow, but it's, it's an inch high, an inch or two high. Very long lived miniature trees, sort of mountain bonsai, if you like. And these, this particular plant here has, has got some special galls on it. These are galls of a Pontania wasp, which only makes its galls on the leaves of, of dwarf willow. So a tiny tree 
which lives to a great age. So, you know, trees are an inch or two high, but which can be centuries old as individual plants. Carpeting the ground, here are their seed heads decorated with a lovely little mountain moth. And here is the dwarf willow on the summits with its own mycorrhizal fungi. So this is a dwarf willow on the, on the blasted exposed summits of the Carnevi with its own woodland fungi assemblage. These fungi here are not growing, though they are growing amongst some grass, but they're growing in direct association with the dwarf willow that's carpeting the ground here. So some of them are familiar species like fly ag agaric and sep that you might see in the lowlands, but here uh, growing at 800, 900 meters. Some of them are special Arctic alpine fungi like Amanita nivalis, the snow grisette on the left and the Russula pascua on the right. And these fungi are growing in this direct mycorrhizal association, sort of symbiotic with the, with the willow. And that's a remarkable assemblage, you know, large, a wide range of fungi species growing together with this miniature tree. This is perhaps my favourite habitat of Snowdonia. This is the upside down forest. This is the woodland where the fungi are taller than the trees. The mushrooms tower above the woodland upon which they with, with which they live, in association with which they live. It's the remarkable, remarkable thing to see. So this is one of the key habitats of the highest summits of the Carnevi. That's where the largest areas of this habitat are in Wales. It's a woodland ecosystem in miniature on the mountain tops. It's a stable habitat, millennia old, surviving under extreme conditions and it is ancient. It's also very isolated if you think about it as a as a woodland ecosystem this fungi tree interaction is so far from the nearest woodland it's also very rare habitat. So that puts in, con puts in context the summits and I'll just say a few words about the, some of the challenges facing this tundra habitat. Um, atmospheric nitrogen deposition has been an issue. Climate change clearly is an issue. And recreation and grazing pressures are also issues. I'm not going to dwell on these because there's an entire separate set of, of sort of conversations about this. But it's important to be aware that these habitats that have survived for millennia, our most ancient habitats in Snowdonia, are at, at risk. Whether it's from the braiding of paths on the ridges, trampling damage, or uh, grazing pressures, or indeed development, of course, these are not in the Carnevi, but it's uh, it's important to uh, to recognise that these high summit habitats, you know, can under some circumstances become uh, threatened by development. So, I showed you reindeer from the Cairngorms, and it looks it looks very much you know in the foreground it looks very much like the the Carnevi, vast expanses of of empty, um, well not empty, but um, undeveloped land with very little disturbance. But that's not really the case. If you've been to the, the Cairngorms hotspots, just like the, the Snowdonia hotspots, you'll know it's not quite as simple as that.
So when we look at the, the high habitats, we can make these links across to, through the tundra and through other habitats to other parts of the world. And I think that's an important, there's an important bit of thinking there, a bit of imagining. It's important because I think it can enrich our experience, but it's also important because I think it can help us understand how precious and in some cases how threatened these are. So this picture, if it were taken in the Carnevi, of course, would be um, a meadow pipit, a very abundant bird, you know, almost ubiquitous, the, um, the famous mountain Mars bar, as it were. Um, as, as it happens, this picture isn't from the Carnevi. It could have been, but it isn't. This is from high Arctic Norway, and this is a red-throated pipit. But the point is, it's the same habitat with slight shifts in the individual species. The dotterel is a breeding species in, in the Cairngorms in Scotland and the high Arctic and has bred in the Carnevi. So it's, it's part of our story in a very, very sort of um, fragile sort of sense of the, of the word. And that fragility is part of that story. I, as a conservationist, you know, I look at the, the situation of the tundra habitats on the Carnevi, and they are challenged. You know, the climate challenge is vast. The, the other pressures that I mentioned briefly are also very significant, but I can't help but cling on to the to the hope and to the idea that these habitats do have an ebb and flow. You know, looking back over that long time series, thinking about, you know, the big changes in climate over, you know, geological time or the sort of time scales of, of the, of the um, glacial periods that, we, that I've mentioned maybe the tundra habitat is in a decline phase at the moment but maybe that you know is a is a a, a sort of uh, an expression of the times we're in those times will change and maybe there is a future in which who knows the dotterel might lay its eggs once again on the carnevi I, I love that thought. I think that is an inspiring thought and I will hold on to it. It's, it's of great value to me. And the value above all should be in the things that we know are here now, that we know are part of the landscape now whether that's the big and obvious, the large herbivores, okay, it's not a reindeer, but so what? Actually, it's just as interesting in its own way, a carnivai pony, or something small and perhaps not well known, like this little weaver's wave moth, a globally important population living on the heathlands of the Carnevi, seen on a pretty much an annual basis at places like Pensachnant in the northern tip of the Carnevi. These things that are here now are what really matter. They matter most, but it's, I think it's helpful and healthy to imagine pasts and futures where what's here now is part of a longer continuum of nature in the Carnevi. And that's where our work comes in. As an organisation, the Snowdonia Society has a special interest in getting people, particularly young people, out into the landscape, out active, 
doing something to help the nature of Snowdonia, of the Carnevi and the other parts of Snowdonia. Doing what we can, being part of the story of looking after this place, whether it's controlling invasive species or fixing the footpaths, whatever the work they're doing, I hope in some small way we're part of the story of Snowdonia, of the Carnevi, and we will be very busy as part of the Carnevi Landscape Partnership Project, which has just recently started. Our volunteers, our young people and old, will be out, will be busy helping to look after the Carnevi. So, Diochamurandach. Uh, I will just quickly show you on one slide just to say a special thank you to the those who have given images that I've been able to use in this talk and others. Special thanks to those.